Trish, welcome to the Legal Talk series. So we were first introduced by a mutual contact, Dawn Everard. She suggested that with your background of working in the arts and Indigenous culture and intellectual property, or ICIP, you would be a great person to join us as our guest speaker for the 2021 NAIDOC week. The theme for that year was Healing Country, and you spoke about First Nations arts and cultural protocols. Since then, you've both contributed to a new topic on ICIP in the IP module of Practical Guidance that was published early this year. What can you tell us has happened in this area in the last couple of months? Thanks, Rebecca. I'd like to start off by acknowledging that I'm zooming in from Bidjigal and Gadigal country and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and thank them for their custodianship and stewardship of this beautiful saltwater country that I'm lucky to live on. This year has been really busy and there's a lot happening. As most people know, we have a new government Labor government, and there's also a new arts minister, the Honourable Tony Burke, and he's committed to a new cultural policy, which will have First Nations arts and culture up front. There'll be national consultations of this work happening very soon as well. The work at IP Australia continues with their Indigenous program unit that meets with the Indigenous reference group. We're just finalising the terms of reference to a point brand new advisory committee, which is also really exciting. And this committee will work on advising IP Australia around Indigenous knowledge and ICRP issues that they see in terms of trademark applications, pattern applications, design and plant breeders' rights as well. This is a really sort of new space that IP Australia is hoping to develop in the next year, which is also very exciting. There's also work happening in the First Nations cultural heritage space around reforms at the Commonwealth and state and territory levels. And there's a new body called the First Nations Cultural Heritage Alliance, which is also working on these issues across the country and with the new Labor government as well. And just continuing on the work with the First Nations arts and cultural protocols are really being seen and heard around the arts and cultural sector. And it's really growing interest on how to apply these protocols into everyday programs as well as organisations. I met with a couple of weeks ago the National Education Curriculum Peak Body, ACARA, and they're also looking at implementing these First Nations protocols within the National Arts Education Curriculum. So just looking at developing some resources for teachers in this area as well. It's it's not um, something that was even on the cards, I think, when we first started working with you and now there's just so much happening. It's fantastic. It's really great to to see the increased voices, I think, in the arts and cultural space for the need to hear more First Nations artists and, and cultural practitioners as well. Absolutely. And I think people are realising that there is a lot of wisdom in these voices too. On to the next question. This year's theme for NAIDOC Week is get up, stand up and show up. To us, this means that the importance of amplifying of the voice of Indigenous peoples is highlighted more than ever. What's your take on this? And how does this also tie in with your work on the Indigenous Advisory Group with IP Australia, the World Intellectual Property Organisation? No, I think it's really exciting to have this theme for NAIDOC in July. It's really seen as about supporting First Nations self-determined practice and voice as the country also moves towards the discussions around, you know, the Uluru Statement and having first, more First Nations voices in Parliament. We now have several First Nations politicians in Parliament, which is also really exciting. Last week, I was on beautiful Cubby Cubby country on the Sunshine Coast, Queensland, at the IATSA Summit, and the Honourable Linda Burney, who is the Minister for Indigenous Australians, gave a really accelerating speech and everyone was really excited to see her and hear from her. So I really think there's excitement around having First Nations people lead on First Nations issues around the country. And just going back to the work that's happening at IP Australia, we can see that happening also at IP Australia. They have 
more First Nations people working at IP Australia. There is a Indigenous unit uh, led by an Indigenous man, Matt McClay, and he works really closely with the advisory group so that First Nations voices can be seen and heard in this IP space so as to maintain and protect Indigenous cultural IP in the areas of trademarks and patents and, and designs as well. While we wait for potentially new law reform in this area to fully protect Indigenous cultural IP. And overseas in Geneva at the United Nations Specialised Agency, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organisation, they've also continued their discussions on traditional knowledge. They actually had a meeting last week in Geneva and they had a number of Indigenous representatives that attended that meeting. And I'm really looking forward to also attending the next Intergovernmental Committee meeting in September which will focus on traditional cultural expressions and traditional knowledge as well. Sounds fantastic. So can you tell us more about the World Intellectual Property Organisation, or WIPO, and the traditional knowledge division work? Yeah, so it's a really interesting area that I was actually fortunate enough to work in Geneva in 2010. I was the Indigenous Law Fellow back then. So back in 2000, WIPO did a huge fact-finding mission around the world to talk to different Indigenous community representatives, non-government organisations, lawyers, academics, and also governments around issues to do with traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. And so after this work, after they collated all the issues, WIPO then established in 2001 the Intergovernmental Committee on Intellectual Property and genetic resources, traditional knowledge and folklore that meets every year to discuss the issues around protecting traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions and genetic resources. So they meet three times a year in Geneva and the committee is made up of WIPO member states, so, you know, government departments, as well as Indigenous representatives and non-government organisations. So there's about 300 people in the room every meeting And the IGC, as it's called, is tasked with developing new international instruments that will better protect Indigenous knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. And so the work that's been happening has been going on since, as I said, 2001. And there was a meeting last week and there'll be two more meetings this year in September and December. And it's really to finalise the draft articles that are in these instruments. There's three instruments that deal with a whole range of issues that are relevant to Indigenous communities and local communities. As you can imagine, it's quite a a tough committee for everyone to obviously agree upon, but the work is still happening. Countries are still engaged in this work and these discussions continue. It does take a really long time to develop new international instruments but it's really sort of important work that's happening. And then also the Traditional Knowledge Division at WIPO, the Secretariat for the IGIC, but also other work that they do is around sort of capacity building for countries who want to, you know, support this work and implement national legislation around protecting traditional knowledge. So while this work is happening at the IGC, countries will also look at developing their own sort of policies and guidelines and potentially laws to to fully protect uh, traditional knowledge as well. All right, thanks. Yes, it would be a tough committee. So you said um, there's about 300 people in the room every meeting. It's a lot of people to agree, but it's great that it's making progress. The Intergovernmental Committee is the IGC. Yeah. Okay, so when and why did WIPO decide to establish the IGC on IP and traditional knowledge, genetic resources and folklore? Yeah, I think after the fact-finding mission in 2000, WIPO had a really, back then, a really sort of supportive Director-General and also the current Director-General, I should say, is also very supportive of the IGC's work. But the Director-General back then, Francis Gurry, Francis Gurry really wanted to, to continue this work and see change happening in this area. And so the WIPO set up the IGC in 2001 after hearing 
a lot of the issues coming from Indigenous communities and advocates and lawyers in this space that there were a lot of issues around misuse and misappropriation of Indigenous knowledge and cultural mm -hmm. expressions. So they're seeing examples around the world of knowledge being taken from Indigenous communities and you know, no permission being sought, no payment or royalties going back to those communities across sort of artistic and cultural knowledge, but also around sort of genetic resources. So, for example, pharmaceutical companies using particular mm -hmm. genetic resources and not getting permission from communities to use that knowledge. And mm -hmm. so this is really why WIPO decided to, to establish the traditional knowledge division, but also to establish the IGC to really talk about these issues Mm -hmm. um, see if there could be anything done and then in later years, you know, establish these new international instruments to protect Indigenous communities and also local communities. So they sort of include, you know, for example, in Malaysia, there are cultural, different cultural communities that have their own knowledge and cultural practices that they want to see protected. Or like in many of the Caribbean islands, they also have cultural expressions and knowledge that they also want to pre see protected. That's what I say, Indigenous peoples and local communities, part of this new sort of draft international instrument that the IGC is talking about at WIPO. Right. Thank you for that. So where is the IGC work up to? As I said, there was a meeting last week on genetic resources and the draft instrument on genetic resources is probably the most sort of difficult to finalise because there are so many differing ideas and opinions about where, you know, where the protection should be. So, for example, some WIPO member states and countries want to see databases established so that Indigenous people and local communities would register their genetic resources in databases. But a lot of Indigenous communities argue, well, databases are really difficult for particularly remote communities where they may not have good access to Wi-Fi or they might not have computers yes. um, or they may not even, you know, speak or read and write, you know, English or Spanish in South America, for example. And so how would people be using these databases to put their and register their genetic resources? But also some communities don't feel comfortable having a, a database when they might have sort of secret or sacred genetic Absolutely. resources that they, they don't want to register on a register. So, you know, these types of issues sort of come up when we're talking about these draft instruments, but the IGC uh, has the mandate to continue these discussions for the next couple of years. And then at the WIPO General Assemblies in October, they normally consider the work of the IGC and decide whether to continue these discussions to finalise these international instruments. So that's really where the, the work's up to at the moment. We've sort of had a bit of a hiatus, like everybody in the world, because of COVID. So, you know, the last two years, yeah. uh, the IGCs <laughs> try, try to meet online. It's Obviously, that's really difficult with all the different time zones in the world. So it's good to, to see that the work is, is starting to ramp up again in person in Geneva. Yes, a lot of things going on. And yes, I could imagine with having over 300 people in a meeting, yes. it would be a lot more difficult to be able to have everyone participate online. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think there will be new international instruments that do develop from the IGC's work? I am forever hopeful <laughs> that there will be international instruments. You know, these discussions have been going on since 2001 and it's 2022 now. <laughs> so I think that I feel that, you know, it will take a few more years for these discussions to continue. But I remember talking to someone at WIPO and they were saying, well, at least countries are still involved in these discussions and they haven't sort of left the IGC discussions. So there is hope that these instruments will be implemented and developed. It just sort of depends how long they'll take. I think there has been criticism in the past that it is taking too long, mm. but I am always hopeful that, you know, we will see new instruments in this area. And I also feel like, you know, the world is changing. People are wanting to hear more diverse voices. They're wanting to hear First Nations voices. 
in different areas, particularly in, in the legal area as well. So with that sort of almost social change, I feel like these instruments will definitely be developed in the future. It definitely sounds like the time has come. Yes. <laughs> yes, I feel hopeful. <laughs> yeah. So moving back to Australia, what new developments are happening here? Can you tell us a bit about the work you're doing with IP Australia? Yeah, sure. So, you know, as I said, the, the, the new reference advisory group will be established at IP Australia. So there'll be, once the terms of reference finalised, there'll be a call out nationwide for people to join the uh, Indigenous advisory group, which will be open to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across different areas, such as the legal area, but also we want community representatives, elders, business owners to be part of this advisory group as well. So that's happening as we speak. There's also been the continued work happening at the federal government level around a committee that's looking at a scoping study for new laws to protect ICIP. So that's sort of still underway. That working group has representation from a number of different federal departments um, and it'll be interesting to see how that continues, given we have a new government as well. And I think also with the new Arts Minister, Honourable Tony Burke, um, and with, with the National Cultural Policy and First Nations Arts and Culture as one of the first principles and pillars of that policy, I think we'll see developments happening in that area in relation to the cultural policy as well. I know that Linda, the Honourable Linda Burney, also talked sort of before the election about looking at protection of ICOP as well. But we also have on foot at the moment with the previous Arts Minister, Honourable Paul Fletcher, the National Indigenous Visual Arts Plan. So that, that was a five-year plan to also look at better protection for Indigenous visual arts and also ICOP in that area. And the Productivity Commission as part of the 2018 parliamentary inquiry into inauthentic Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander style art. Yes. Um, the Productivity Commission is also looking at work in this area around protection of ICIP. So we're also waiting to hear from them around their recommendations from the work that they were looking at last year as well. So there, there are a number of different developments happening in this in this area and it's a very sort of exciting time as well to work in the First Nations arts and cultural space. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you again for that. And what is happening with the uh, National Indigenous Arts and Cultural Authority work at the Australia Council? Yes, we are continuing these discussions at the Australia Council for the Arts. We're sort of acting as the secretariat for the First Nations Arts and Cultural Sector. So in October this year in Adelaide, we'll be holding a First Nations Arts and Cultural Summit called Purumpu. And this will bring together First Nations artists and cultural practitioners from across the country to discuss issues across all different art forms like visual arts, literature, music, dance, going forward what the sector would like to see in some sort of, you know, national First Nations peak body for the arts. And so that work is sort of continuing and we're developing that work at the moment at the Australia Council alongside a lot of the work that is happening also in the cultural heritage space as well as the Uluru Statement work as well. So there are a number of different sort of national discussions happening around protecting Indigenous culture and IP, but also Indigenous voices as well at that sort of national level. So we will continue to support this work at the Australia Council as well. Thank you. Where can our audience find information on ICIP? Yeah, there's really great resources out there on Indigenous cultural IP or ICIP. So one of the leading First Nations lawyer in, in this space, Dr Terry Jenke, uh, she has her own legal practice. And you can find a lot of resources on her website. Also, the National Community Legal Centre, the Arts Law Centre of Australia, has really good resources as well and graphic uh, sort of cartoons as well on their website around ICIP. IP Australia also has a number of different resources under their policy area on Indigenous knowledge. 
a couple of years ago, they developed a really interesting resource around protecting ICIP for Indigenous businesses as well. So there are a number of videos on their website as well. And they have a yarn yarning line as well that businesses can call to find out more information about how to protect ICIP in terms of IP as well. And then sort of going to the Australia Council, obviously we have the First Nations Arts and Cultural Protocols on our website that are free to download as well. These principles, sorry, these protocols were developed by Dr. Terry Jenke and her team. So they have the 10 True Tracks principles that she has developed over the years so they're in the protocols as well as 14 case studies with a number of different Indigenous artists and organisations across the country that we support that sort of work through those 10 principles in the protocols and then sort of going overseas WIPO obviously has their traditional knowledge division that has a number of really good guidelines and resources on their website as well that you can download for free so there's a lot of different organisations that provide information around ICIP, as well as the obviously the Lexis Nexus new ICIP chapter that Delwyn and I worked on as well last year. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Trish, and um, I look forward to catching up with you again. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca.